Hello and welcome to Quadcast, Quadrant Chambers discussion forum looking at news, hot topics and legal developments in the world of commercial litigation. The format is very simple, drink, talk, chat. Drink, we invite you to join us for a drink. I've got a delicious glass of beer here. Uh, talk, we're going to talk about a legal topic each week. Uh, uh, this time it's arbitration and chat. We want you to join in. You can chat on the YouTube function if you're watching us live on YouTube or you can email us quadcast at quadrantchambers.com. And hosting Quadcast with me this week, as always, Poonam Mawani, Joe Sullivan and Claudia Wilmot-Smith. So let's just go round and catch up with uh, each person. Uh, Poonam, your, your news this week. Well, I guess it's not really my news, it's all of our news. And um, I wanted to apologize to the Quadcast viewers for um, not airing us last week and postponing it to this week. As I'm sure most of you know, that was because a much loved uh, member of Chambers, Simon Cavandal QC, passed away unexpectedly at the beginning of uh, last week, uh, which uh, has knocked us all a bit for six. Uh, and we are thinking very much of his wife and um, his two sons. Um, we, Simon w was just one of the nicest guys in Chambers, uh, but we had chosen this topic uh, obviously before it had happened, arbitration. But I think that's rather apt and it's made me smile because Simon loved nothing more than to be in arbitration. It's what he did, what he loved, and he'll know far more about what we're talking about than the four of us put together. So um, the Quadcast team are dedicating uh, this week uh, to Simon Cavandle. Uh, but I wanted you to see a little bit of how we know and love him. And coming up is a picture of Simon in a suit he had specially made for a Christmas lunch a couple of um, years ago. So um, I just want to say love you, Simon, and missing you, and uh, this is for you. Uh, Claudia, how has your last couple of weeks been, aside from obviously thinking about Simon? Yeah, I mean, I love that picture of Simon. <laughs> I, I love that he got that suit made. <laughs> um, I saw that picture for the first time, actually. We had Chambers drinks. Um, in his honor on friday just before those drinks i got burgled i guess as lockdown lifts people think oh people are out of their house and so someone broke into my flat and took my laptop and all my jewelry which wasn't the best development but what was the nicest development was the reaction of members of chambers the female members of chambers all sent me a bottle of 2008 dom perignon which is our producer emily's favorite so Thank you to her for the recommendation and to everyone else who sent it. And uh, they also sent me a bunch of flowers and I was just so overwhelmed. And um, so thank you guys. I just got all of those yesterday, which is why it's still like the highlight of my life. Um, so thank you to everyone. I hope Joe's news has been as good as my receipt of champagne and not as bad as my burglary. Well, possibly less significant. I mean, I've been basically just trying to watch loads of Premier League football, <laughs> little of it for so long. Um, From what I understand, that's more significant than anything else. Well, possibly, yeah. Uh, Bill Shankly would say that. I mean, I guess you, you, you guys probably know that I'm a Liverpool fan. So it started off with so much excitement, and then I watched the most boring game of all time, the Merseyside derby. But happily, it picked up last night with a, a 4 0 thrashing of Crystal Palace. So I'm in a pretty good mood. Um, how about you, Paul? Well, my, uh, I've also been watching football, but even more significant than that, I have made a discovery for the benefit of all mankind and womankind. I have perfected, since my arbitration ended, perfected my Yorkshire pudding recipe. So for a period of about two weeks, every day I made a batch, tweaked the recipe and the fruits, I think I've got a picture to show you, the, uh, the fruit of that is what I think is now the perfect, the ultimate Yorkshire pudding recipe. So I'm feeling... Pretty, pretty, well, Pretty pleased with myself on so that. So they're four there for the four Quadcast members. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you wouldn't want those there. That was, that was <laughs> ago. But uh, yeah, if, if you play your cards right, I'll, I'll make you all a batch. Um, so this week we are looking at uh, arbitration and particularly the interaction of the court's powers to supervise and interfere with the powers of the arbitrator. And we've got four different subtopics that we're going to look at, each person in the team looking at one aspect. And I think we're kicking off with uh, Joe, I think with section 67 and 68, is that right? 
Yeah, that's right. So um, Section 67 and 68, key important part of the court's supervisory jurisdiction over arbitrations. Um, and, uh, on which note, um, regular viewers um, may remember that we discussed the Chubb and Enker Court of Appeal decision in uh, a couple of couple of podcasts ago, um, which touches on generally the scope of the court's supervisory jurisdiction. And the hot news on that is that it's going to the Supreme Court on an expedited appeal. It's going to be heard in July. So there may be um, something, uh, some interesting developments about how the court approaches its supervisory jurisdiction. Hang on, Joe. Has the Supreme Court promised an expedited judgment? <laughs> Our very first quadcast was about Marex, where the Supreme Court haven't handed down for, what is it now, a year and two months? Um, yeah, well, no, um, far as I know, they haven't. So who knows? Maybe maybe we'll hear sometime in 2022 or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to Section 67 and 68. Um, Section 67 is challenged on the ground that the award was granted outside the arbitral tribunal's substantive jurisdiction. And Section 68 is a challenge on the ground of a serious irregularity which has caused or will cause substantial injustice to one or both of the parties. I've got five brief points on these sections. Um, the first is you need to exhaust any um, review or appeal process that's within the arbitration or the arbitral rules before you apply to, to court. And if it's available, you also need to have exhausted any possibility of applying for correction of the award under Section 57 of the Act. Um, if you've done that, then you've got 28 days to bring your, your Section 67 or 68 claim. And that's from either the date of the award or, if later, the date that you've been notified of the outcome of any review or appeal process. So it's quite a tight deadline. Uh, the second point is it has to you have to rely on a point that you either brought up in the original arbitration or you, you were unable to bring it up and you wouldn't have been able to bring it up even if you'd exercised reasonable diligence. So you can't just bring up something if you, if you could have pursued the point in the original arbitration. And that's a point of distinction between a Section 68 challenge and a court claim to set aside a court judgment where a uh, year before last, the Supreme Court said the reasonable diligence requirement does not apply, a case called Takar and Gracefield. Third point is you can't appeal a Section 67 or 68 decision unless you have the, the leave of the trial judge. If he, says no, if he or she says no, you can't ask for permission from the Court of Appeal. That's common in a lot of sections in the Arbitration Act. Um, fourth point is... Um, for a jurisdiction challenge under Section 67, it's a full rehearing. It's not a review of the arbitrator's decision. So you can have, you have witnesses. It's, it's as if it's a de novo decision. Uh, and then finally, on a Section 68 challenge where the ground is um, fraud, where the award was obtained by fraud, that fraud has to be um, the party's fraud. The party to the, to the um, arbitral decision has to have been responsible for the fraud. You can't just say, well, a witness came along and gave evidence that I now know is a lie, and therefore I want the decision to be revisited. So, but the fraud presumably has to be a fraud, almost a fraud within the arbitration or on the arbitrator about the way the arbitration was conducted or something. Well, about the it has to be well. It can be about the way it can be about the facts of the arbitration. So it it can be anything to do with the way that the award was obtained, but it has to be something that the party did or was responsible for. Um, so those are the sections about challenging the award, as distinct from appealing an award, which I think um, Claudia you, you've been looking at. Yes. So. Section 69 allows a party to appeal against an arbitration award on the basis of an error of law. So the first point to make is that English law is actually somewhat anomalous in this respect. Most jurisdictions don't allow any right of appeal on the merits to the courts of the seat. England does, and but it is narrow in scope. 
So the appeal must be in respect of a question of law, which the tribu uh, tribunal was asked to determine. And the determination must substantially affect the rights of the parties. Their decision must be either obviously wrong or open to serious doubt and of general public importance. And if you can establish that, then the court has to consider whether it is just and proper in all of the circumstances to consider the appeal, despite the fact that the parties have agreed to arbitration. And that is actually a test that's not always met. So there are cases in which the courts have said, open to serious doubt and of general public importance, but have declined to exercise their discretion to allow leave to appeal because they've said, because of something in the manner of the party's choice of arbitration, that it isn't just and proper to allow an appeal. And um, so it's not enough that the arbitrators got it wrong. And I quite like a uh, quote attributed to Michael Carr, the former Court of Appeal judge, who said, remember, when the parties agree to arbitration, they buy the right to get the wrong answer. So what he meant was that whilst you can appeal if the arbitrators got it wrong, the mere fact that it's wrong doesn't justify the court's intervention. Uh, you, you have to go quite a lot further. And it is actually very narrow the circumstances in which appeals permission to appeal will be granted and in which appeals will be successful and just quite how narrow the test is that if you look at the stats so the commercial court users group met in november last year and said that in 2018 to 2019 there were 39 applications for permission to appeal under section 69 um, and none of them succeeded sorry in the whole year only 39 yeah and I think one was seven of them, surely. Come on. Only 39, okay. That's uh, the year before there were 87, but apparently this isn't so much a decline. Apparently, the year before was quite anomalous in the numbers. And of those 87, two succeeded. So it's really not that common either to get permission to appeal or um Do you even think you can? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I've seen the view trumpeted, particularly by Bernard Eder, but I don't think he stands alone in this. In a number of lectures, he talks about the fact that English law has a right of appeal at all is actually something that makes London arbitration less marketable than he would like in the international market. And so he actually talks about how rare it is to get permission. He brings out these stats in support of the view that London is a competitive arbitration market because he says there's quite a lot of criticism uh, because if uh, the, the appeal process necessarily delays things. It means the arbitrator's decision. Hold on, hold on. Presumably you can agree English law, English arbitration, but still exclude the right of appeal. Can you do that? You can yes. do that. Right? Yes, you can. And not only can you choose to, the two major London arbitral uh, institutions, the ICC and the LCIA rules, both actually exclude the right of appeal unless you agree to the contrary. So the LMAA doesn't, the London Maritimes Arbitration Association, and perhaps for that reason, most of these appeals that I've talked about, and by most, I mean at least three quarters, I think, are actually shipping cases. Uh, so if it's arbitration and not shipping, it's super rare to get an appeal. And uh, the Lord Chief Justice, John Thomas, actually said that this, he, he gave a lecture in 2016 that said that he thinks this is leading to the slow, inexorable decline of the English common law. He would like to see a more flexible test for permission to appeal to enable their courts to more readily develop the law. Uh, so if the tribunal have got it wrong, you can appeal, but the right's quite limited. If before they got it wrong, you can see it coming because you have your doubts about an arbitrator, Poonam, is there anything you can do? Yeah, but it won't work either. It's about <laughs> as likely to be successful as a 69 application. So I'm talking about section 24, which is the provision where you can apply to court to remove an arbitrator. I chose it because I've been really busy at work and I wanted something easy and small, but it's been great fun. I know nothing about this. I've been reading up just the podcast. So guys, you can apply to remove an arbitrator um, if you can show some doubts, justifiable doubts as to impartiality. You can say he's unqualified, if you can say he's unfit, or if he hasn't properly conducted the arbitration. The, the bracket at the end for all of those, you have to be in, able to allege, like in 69 and 68, I think it's in both, uh, that substantial injustice has been caused as well. But what the courts have said is that when you're talking about things like bias, 
lack of qualification on fitness, then it's almost, it's a dead set. You're then going to be able to show um, substantial injustice. So it's not really in real life a two-tier test. In real life, the first tier, trying to prove the, the, impart, the lack of impartiality, the bias, etc., is the hard one. The test is... Um, whether a fair-minded and reasonable observer, an informed observer, would conclude that there was a real possibility or a real danger, it's not a prob probability or likelihood, um, that uh, there was a real danger uh, that the tribunal was or seemed to be biased. Seemed to be. So it's apparent bias, it's not actual bias. It's both. Lord Hoffman's famous uh, amnesty case would have... Where he was like, of course I'm not biased, I'm Lord Hoffman, but it's the appearance of bias that's important, right? As well, quite. Yeah. So now, guys, before I'm going to hand over to Paul in section 44, and we're all going to talk about this some more, but just a little teaser question. Just give me a yes or no answer. Um, imagine, and actually thank you to Paul Stock of Radius Law, who told me about this. Um, imagine an arbitrator or mediator sends a CV to the parties when he's looking for the appointed as a seller or one of the arbitrators where he deliberately removes references to some of his leading cases where he was a solicitor for one of the sides. Uh, would you think that when that came out, you'd be able to get rid of him on the grounds of apparent bias as a shortcut? Claudia? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Joe? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. If it's deliberate, yeah. So, boring question to get all the same answer, the but it's not boring because Paul tells me it's a true story. He says it was before my time. He's been very kind about my age, but it actually happened. And the excuse of the arbitrator mediator, whose name I don't know, uh, nothing before my time it was a fax machine, was that the fax sort of got crumpled as he was sending it and, and Googled up the paragraph. <laughs> It's a wonderful story. Um, we'll come back to all of this, but Paul, tell us about Section 44. Section 44. Before I talk about Section 44, a couple of things. Just a reminder, if you've got questions, comments, please do uh, chat along in YouTube or email them to podcast at quadrantchambers.com. We do want to get your comments, and if we can, we'll incorporate them uh, and use them as we go along. And the other thing is I've just had a message on my screen, Joe, that Apparently, the results are going your way today, aren't they, with the Liverpool uh, situation? Have you seen this? Well, just the football, football boys, come on. Jeez. Sorry. Sorry. God. Right. Um, Section 44. Section 44 of the court's powers to grant interim measures in support of an arbitration. I've got five headline points, and then I've got a case study uh, or a couple of questions for you all and for our audience. So, first point is very simple one, Section 23 of the... Arbitration Act provides that these powers are uh, it can be used by the English courts in support of all arbitrations. So wherever the seat of the arbitration is, doesn't matter. You can apply to the English court for an injunction or to compel a witness or to preserve evidence or assets and that sort of thing. Secondly, urgency is essential. Urgency will be is a strict requirement of these uh, applications. And to the extent that even if you get an injunction from the court, and by the time the return date comes around, uh, the urgency is gone, the court will refuse to hear the application under section 44, subsection three, that is, uh, unless uh, the either the parties agree or the arbitrator directs that the court can hear it. Um, thirdly, uh, only for, only for preserving evidence or assets, that's the, uh, without the arbitrator's agreement or the parties' agreement. Section 4.3 says this, if the case is one of urgency, the court may on the application of a party or proposed party to the arbitral proceedings, make such orders that it thinks necessary for the purposes of preserving evidence or assets. You can't go to court for any other purpose than that. Fourth point is that there is this interplay with section 44.3 and section 37 of the Senior Courts Act. So for example, it, section 44 doesn't apply to an anti-suit injunction, which is still governed by section 37 of the Senior Courts Act. So uh, there is this scope to argue, and the law is not really developed in this sense, this scope to argue, if you can't bring yourself within section 44, you can possibly say, well, nevertheless, the jurisdiction I rely upon is this, this umbrella jurisdiction in section 37 of the Senior Courts Act. 
Why does Section 37 get to expand the express Section 44 rights? Because if you're not within the code of the Arbitration Act, the court still has a residual jurisdiction to grant injunctive relief in all cases where it's just and convenient. So if you can argue that, for example, in an anti-suit injunction, what you're saying there is your substantive right is not to be vexed by proceedings that are um, in, not in accordance with the terms of the contract. You can argue that you're outside of the 96 Act and therefore you're in so the why is it, So that contractual right not to be sued isn't an asset that's worth preserving? Well, we'll come to that because uh, whilst this is a strict uh, a strict requirement in Section 44.3, it's not applied <laughs> quite liberally, but more of that in a moment. And my last point is that you can only generally apply for injunctive relief against a party to the arbitration. Ge generally speaking, the powers in Section 44 are limited to applications against the parties to the arbitration agreement. There is an exception just been recognised this year in the context of compelling witnesses. And in, the co in that context, case of ANC that just went to the Court of Appeal uh, in the last month or so, decided that that power of the court is open generally. Witnesses who are not parties to the arbitration agreement can be compelled. So let me give you a couple of questions then. Bearing in mind, under section 44.3, you can only apply for the purposes of preserving evidence or assets. Okay, and I think we're gonna flick up this case study on the screen. Uh, the case study is this. A Limited has sold a cargo of fish to B on uh, cost and freight terms. The agreement contains an arbitration clause. At the point of discharge, the buyer refuses to take delivery. The fish will not be saleable in three days' time, perishable goods, and there is no time to appoint an arbitrator. Now, the fish are evidence in the arbitration or in, in the dispute, and the dispute will be over payment of money. So the question is, can you get it within section 44.3? Can you argue that this is a dispute in relation or an injunction to present pr preserve evidence or assets. Let's go around. Uh, Claudia, what do you say? These are the fish aren't evidence. Yes or no. Can the court, does the court have jurisdiction under section 44.3 to grant uh, an order for the sale of the fish? No. Joe? Yeah, I would say no too. Puna? Absolutely, yes. Well, no decided case, but uh, Lord Justice Clark in uh, Settlement said that he thought you could, you could uh, grant, uh, and, uh, and you will say, well, how on earth is that preserving evidence or assets? The so argument then, is. So it doesn't have to be your assets then? Uh, well, the argument is the asset isn't the fish, the asset is the claim for money. It's tenuous. But if, you, if the fish aren't sold, then the value of the claim is diminished because of the effectively the value of the underlying cargo is will they'll go rotten, putrefy. Now I've got another one, okay. So we're going to put this one out to a vote. Um, can we put up the second case study here? So this is a little bit longer. Um, what we've got here is a sale of shares. A sells its shares in a company, XYZ Limited, to B, and the completion date is in three days' time. The agreement contains an arbitration clause. All steps have been taken to effect the sale, but A refuses to send the share certificate to the company registrar for registration. And there's no time to appoint an arbitrator before the agreed completion date. If the completion doesn't go through, B's funding will fall away and B will not be able to acquire the shares. The question is, can you, yes or no, can the court, does the court have jurisdiction to grant an injunction compelling A to comply with A's contractual duty to send the share certificate to the registrar, i.e., can we argue that this is for the purpose of preserving evidence or assets? Now, I'm not going to ask the four of you for your answer. I'm going to ask the viewers, please, to vote on this. If you possibly can, we need votes. You need to go to www.quadcast.vote. I'll say that again. I don't know if we can get it on the screen, www.quadcast.vote. If you go there, you'll see the case study. There'll be a yes or no button. Just vote yes or no, and then we'll come back to the results and we'll come back to members of the panel uh, after. Like the X Factor, but you don't have to pay to vote. Sorry? I said it's like the X Factor, but you don't have to pay for vote. This is really exciting. You don't have to pay. It's all free. 
Um, so I think we go to Joe next. Uh, yeah, we just need to go shout at the children in the garden who are making too much noise. And I'll be back in 30 seconds. You keep going. Okay. We don't have to look up the answer. <laughs> now the viewers know it's live. It's definitely live. If you weren't convinced it was live from Poonam's hair catching fire the other week, then uh, you know it is now. Uh, Joe, I think you're going to uh, give us some sort of problem in relation to... So yeah, well, I, I picked out a case that really just sort of indicates the sorts of hurdles that you can have to go through if you want to bring one of these um, challenges to an arbitration award. It's a, it's a case from January this year called Extrata Coal and Banksy Iron. Uh, the facts are boring. It was, it was a case about the sale of coking coal. LCIA arbitration, English law. So the, the sellers brought the arbitration and they succeeded. Uh, but the problem was that the arbitrator made his award in favour of a, a company. There were all sorts of different companies involved in this. He made it in favour of a company that was not actually a party to the contract and, and so not party to the arbitration clause. Um, so when the sellers sought to enforce the award in China, the respondents raised this point and the Chinese courts refused to recognise or enforce the award. So the sellers um, applied to the LCIA for correction of the award under Rule 27 of the LCIA rules. But they had a problem because L uh, Rule 27 says you've got to apply for correction within 30 days of the award. And this was much later. So the LCIA said, sorry, there's just no, no jurisdiction for this. So then the sellers applied to court to extend time uh, for them to make that challenge under Section 79. Um, there was a big spat about whether Rule 27 of the LCIA rules was it was permissible to extend time under Section 79. Mr Justice Knowles heard that and he, he allowed the challenge, he allowed time to be extended. So all, all good, the arbitrator can correct his award, uh, but then he refused to correct, correct his award. Um, not because he thought he got it right, but because he thought that the power to correct was limited to circumstances involving sort of typographical errors and stuff like that. And he said, this doesn't fall into that category. So then the... It's, 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 you got it a little bit wrong, but if you've just completely messed up... <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's it. But anyway, so the sellers then brought a new commercial court claim under Section 68 to um, challenge the award on two grounds. First, uncertainty or ambiguity, and second, uh, serious procedural irregularity. Um, now, they had another time problem here because it was way longer than 28 days after the award was, was handed down. It was within 28 days of the arbitrator saying he wouldn't correct the award, but the respondents said, that isn't a review process or an appeal process, so you're out of time. Well, um, uh, it was Mr. Justice Butcher who heard this case. He adopted a liberal approach to what is meant by a review or appeal for the purposes of the 28-day time limit. Um, effectively, he took a purposive approach, said it'd just be, be a nonsense. I, I should have said earlier, incidentally, the 28-day limit can in any event be extended by the court which on, on, on the exercise of uh, discretion. So anyway, he, he said that it was in time and he said, this is a paradigm case for section 68. Obviously the arbitrator has named the wrong party and it should clearly um, be revisited. Um, so um, that's just an example of the, the, the procedural wrangles that you can get into if you want to, if you want to challenge an award. Um, Claudia, what's your um, case on Section 69? I don't have one case. I have a consideration of the issue. So oh, if you know that, Claudia, because you like to tell us lots of things. So, of course, it's more than one case. So, come on, then. But a couple of cases. Oh, goody. Um, so, you've, if you've got permission to appeal, then you've persuaded a judge that the decision of the arbitrator on, was on a question of law that the tribunal had been asked to determine and that it was either obviously wrong or open to serious doubt and of general public importance. So that's all been decided by a judge. You then get to your appeal. How much of that is up for grabs 
Well, in Fern Schiffert's and Romani, I'm probably pronouncing that very wrong, a 2018 decision of Mrs. Justice Mulder, he said, she was really clear on this, she said, the avoidance of doubt and contrary to the written submission for the appellant, I make clear that the question for this court is whether or not an error of law has been established. Uh, the question of whether the decision is obviously wrong or at least open to serious doubt is a threshold question and it is not the test for this court. So she said, basically, that issue, whether it's, if it's the, if the judge granting permission to appeal has held that it's obviously wrong, then that test has already been, that threshold has already been crossed and that's no longer the question for the court. But in Agile Holdings and SR Shipping, which was a 2018 decision, so the same year, again, first instance, his Honour Judge Waxman, who was sitting as a judge of the High Court, said that the threshold questions as to whether the decision was obviously wrong or open to serious doubt are ones which obviously fall for consideration again. And so therefore, which are questions that you're entitled to raise again on appeal. Um, by contrast, he said it was impossible to see how issues about whether the point is of general public importance, that affects the right of the parties and the justice and convenience in granting permission to appeal. He says it's impossible to see how they could arise an appeal. And then in the middle, you have this issue whether or not its question is properly a question of law and whether or not it's one that the tribunal has been asked to determine. He said you can re-argue those points on appeal, uh, even if you've lost on the permission stage, but you'll give considerable weight to the answers um, the answer of the judge granting leave to appeal. So I guess if the judge uh, considering permission to appeal has decided open to serious doubt, then there's still scope for saying, well, yeah, but they still got it right. But if they've said it's obviously wrong, then according to the uh, Mrs. Justice Mulder's reasoning, you've crossed that threshold. You've kind of, yeah, I mean, the question's already been really what she was saying. So if, if, if it's allowed through on obviously wrong on the permission stage, are you saying that Mrs. Justice Mulder's view is that then when the full appeal is heard, well, she's got her learned brethren who said it's obviously wrong, so it's obviously wrong? Well, she, she said, so the question is really, like, I guess what the law is, right? Um, so you can say, well, the law is X or Y, but you can't say, really, I mean, consistently with what she said, you can't say that the tribunal was right if they found to be obviously wrong. Any, any application for permission, though, to, to whether it's a permission to appeal or whatever, surely is only a provisional view that the court takes. But, you know, permission to serve out, all these things, they're always provisional, aren't they? I mean, it, it strikes me as being unrealistic to say that the judge who's then seized with the very issue is somehow um, hands are tied. I think we all agree it's a question of what Mr. Justice Mulder was saying, right? I agree with you. It can't possibly be. Yeah, I mean, I agree. That that seems odd. And because she was obviously considering whether there had been an error of law. But if she says it's a threshold question and not open for consideration, then arguably But maybe she meant you just can't re-argue the thresholds, but anyway. Yeah. Um Okay, guys, 24, because you don't know anything about section 24, so I'm gonna teach you some stuff. Quick question. Uh, just give me a yes or no answer. Let's say your arbitrator, it turns out, is going to have to give evidence. He's going to be a witness in the hearing. Is that, and it has come up lots of times, is that a reason to have him removed as unfit or not impartial or whatever? Can I, can I just be clear, Pingham, before we answer? Is this like properly, properly give evidence, like be sworn in, and then be cross-examined by one side or, or called as a witness by one side or the other? In all the cases, yeah, he is being called as a witness, going into the box in arbitration and going to be cross-examined. Yeah, correct. Joe? Uh, yeah, he shouldn't be allowed to be an arbitrator in that case. Good, yeah. yeah I agree with Joe. Paul? I, I, I agree. His evidence is an issue, and so he's bound to find for himself. I agree with all of you, but we're all wrong, uh, because uh, what the case is apparently saying, well, not apparently, I've read them, um, is no, it's not an inflexible rule. Uh, it depends how important the issue is that he's going to get give evidence on. So, Paul, you were sort of right. It's not how important whether him being sworn in is, but if it's a peripheral issue, that's not enough to chuck it out. If it's a central issue, that might be enough to chuck him out. 
But that actually is because, and this is the real thing I wanted to talk about, there is a difference of approach uh, in the real world to cases where you've just got your bog standard arbitration clause for an arbitrator to be appointed so by the parties, and one where the arbitrator is named in the arbitration agreement. And it's usually in the one where they're named that the arbitrator might end up being a witness because actually he's been named because he's close to both sides or in a lot of cases he's an engineer with one side or whatever. So he actually has personal knowledge. And the fascinating thing is that it's that it a really different approach when it's a named arbitrator. I mean, first of all, freedom of contract, the courts don't want to remove an arbitrator that's been absolutely named. Uh, but what they've said is, you know, you've named this person Knowing that he knows exactly because he has an involved the witness as your arbitrator, and you've anything you knew, anything that the named person knew at the time you signed the contract with him being named, you can't complain about. Um, anything that he would know and understand because of his role, because if he's an engineer or an employee or the accountant family, the lawyer, which was the recent case, you can't complain about it. So they've actually said. Where you would name someone for those, you don't expect them to come without preconceived notions. They're going to come with preconceived notions. They're going to have a prior view. It doesn't matter if they've even have expressed a view one way or the other. That's what you're expecting. What all you can hope for and what, and what you can complain about is that they must have an open mind. They must be willing to listen. They must be willing to change their opinion. I don't know, guys, what do you think? On Quadcast, have we shown we have open minds and are willing to change our opinion? I'm really curious to find out how you can prove that anyone's going to change their opinion. I, as I was saying that, I was thinking about us, <laughs> like, you know, we've argued so much about things. Have any of us changed our mind? I'll have to go watch all of this one day if lockdown continues. So yeah, big difference between those two. And the only other thing I want to say was, you know, I thought there'd be very few cases on Section 24, and there aren't that many, but actually by comparison, 69, a fair number. And there were just, there have been two just in May of this year uh, in lockdown. But don't expect to win. The success rate's even worse than under 69. And the courts use the phrase, it would be an extreme case. So, Paul, um, let's look at the open minds of our audience on your, on your problem. And yes, OK. So shall we just go round and ask you what you thought? Can we put the case study up again? So this is the sale of the company, uh, XYZ, um, and we are asking whether the court has power to, um, uh, to compel A to send the share certificate to the registrar, and whether this, we can somehow shoehorn this within preserving evidence or assets. So let's just go round and ask the team. Uh, Poonam, what do you think, yes or no? I think no. You think no, uh, Claudia? I think yes. Yes, Joe? I think no. No, uh, the our viewers, two thirds to one third, two to one say no. Um, but this was another example discussed in settlement. Sorry, say that again, I didn't hear. Who, who won, me and Joe? Who, or who won? But I think that's inconsistent with what you said about well, the Hang on a minute, no, I, 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 to call it a win, I'm not sure we can, we can go that far. It was an example discussed in settlement. Lord Justice Newberger, that was, it was his example of a case, and the view expressed purely over to of um, Lord Justice Clark, Tony Clark, was that, yes, he thought the court, court could intervene, and it's this other argument using the argument that the value of the claim is the asset, and the yeah, claim see, I changed the, my mind. I changed my mind because I said no for the fish, but I said yes for that because of the fish. Yeah, well, then. Maybe as your you didn't change your mind. You just wanted to sound right for once. For once. Think... once. <laughs> <laughs> that was an undignified high voice. It was. Sorry, I, oh, carry on. Well, let's talk about it. It's okay. We can't all be all of the time. I think it's time to wind up this um, this episode, don't you? Uh, before we descend into a, a fight or a brawl or something. Um, so I, it just leaves me to say, uh, firstly, thank you to Ben Jacobs, who does our vision mixing and production, uh, Fish Eyes Productions, and also Emily Saunderson, who produces the show. Uh, thank you both. Next time, we are going to look at the topic of illegality. Uh, the case of Stockwell and Grondona was before the Supreme Court. 
uh, just a few weeks ago. They haven't delivered judgment yet. It's a, uh, a case about how you interpret Patel and Mirza and the guidelines there given by the Supreme Court in relation to illegality. We'll look at that and we'll look at the circumstances in which you can attack a contract on those on the grounds of illegality. Go I on. thought you were going to say there were circumstances in which you can attack Patel and Mirza, which may... Uh, no, you can't. The line I'm going to be taking next week. So, well, it, it's an interesting area because we, we all thought Tinsley and Milligan was the law uh, for years and then it turned out it wasn't. So that's what we've been looking at. So if you've got questions, email them, please, to quadcast at quadrantchambers.com. Uh, other than that, I hope you will all join us in two weeks, Thursday. Poonam? No, I was going to say it's two weeks, not one week. I was just reminding you to give the timetable. Two weeks. So that just for your points about Thursday, 9th of July, 5 p.m., quadcast returns. See you then.